I think I knew where I wanted to go before the first film was successful because I came up with the basic, the basic structure of a plot during the shooting of Guardians Volume 1. Um, I also knew a lot before I ever even started shooting while I was writing the first screenplay about the background of Peter Quill and Yondu and all of that. So I, I knew I knew what the general shape of the sequel was going to be. I think the thing I didn't really know was, you know, was I going to tell this, the story of Peter Quill and his father as volume two, which I thought was the big reveal, or was I was, you know, maybe perhaps save it for a later time. And uh, I decided, well, I think that's the best story I have at hand right now, so that's what I went with. I think when I was auditioning Star-Lord the first time around, I was looking for somebody who'd come in, do everything that was on the page, do it well, do it in a funny way, but also give that little something extra that made Peter Quill a little bit of a different character. And I think Chris came in and did that immediately. I think Chris is a very unique movie star in that he is a combination of being a big masculine guy, but also a very vulnerable guy. Uh, he has a vulnerability that, say, the classic movie stars sort of hint at, whether it's Humphrey Bogart or Gary Cooper, but that Chris really brings that to life on the screen. And I think that's what makes him a truly modern day movie star. I think that Peter Quill's father has been looking for him for a very long time. And he wants a relationship with his son in the same way Peter wants a relationship with his father. And Peter has really wanted a father since he was a child. This goes back to before his mother passed away when he was a child, when he was on Earth. He carried around a photograph in his pocket of David Hasselhoff, which he told the other kids at school was his dad. And he was off shooting Knight Rider on a tour through uh, Germany playing music. And he has that hole in him, which he shows early on to Gamora, who he's qu grown quite intimate with, you know, in terms of a friendship uh, since the last movie. It's his closest, you know, compatriot. Um, and it is that journey to see if, you know, Ego can fill that Hasselhoff role or not. That is Peter Quill's journey in the movie. I think... You know, Kurt is a naturally likable guy. Kurt tells a story, which is about uh, when he was about to shoot Escape from New York, Snake Plissken, which was one of my favorite movies as a kid. And the studio heads were reading the script, and they're going, this character is completely unlikable. Why are we going to care about this movie? And Kurt said, because he's played by me, and I'm just a naturally likable guy. And that's, that's what Kurt Russell is. He is a naturally likable guy, both in person and on screen. Peter Quill is very clearly in love with Gamora, and uh, it is unknown whether, by him, whether her those feelings are returned or not. I think she has mixed feelings on this subject. She knows that Peter Quill is basically a good person, um, but in the past he has not been a good lover in any way. He has not been a good uh, prime, you know, significant other to women. He's a, he's a, he's a scoundrel. And I think she sees that, I think she knows that, and I think that she is not really looking for that type of love in her life. I think she's looking for family very much, and I think she's found that with the Guardians. And like in the first movie, Gamora is in some ways the most um, elevated of, of, of the characters in the film. Because in the first film, she knew from the beginning that she was out to stop Ronin and stop people from dying. That was why she did what she did. I think in the second movie, she knows that they're a family and she knows that that's something important to them. But she also has certain ways she keeps people at bay and that she keeps Peter at bay. And there is this sort of nutty, nastiness to her at times, a cuttingness. And I think this is something that throughout the film, Gamora comes to terms with, not really through her relationship with Peter Quill, but through her relationship with her sister, um, who in the first movie, we saw Nebula and Gamora had a difficult time with each other and a, a strange sisterly relationship. I think Nebula has only changed from the first film in that at the end of the, the, the first movie, we see Nebula very distinctly decide that everyone around her is crazy. Uh, 
I think this is her own reaction to, to, to knowing other people, but she decides Gamora's crazy, Ronan's crazy, Thanos is crazy. We know she hates Thanos. We know she wants to kill Thanos in the first movie. And she just detaches herself from it all. The act of creating Mantis was a great one. Um, I felt that character quite a bit. I wanted to uh, add a female character who was um, as goofy and silly and strange as uh, the other male characters, basically Drax and Rocket and Groot, who are all just goofballs. And Groot's, I don't know if Groot's, what Groot is, man or a woman, really. But, uh, it's, uh, but I wanted to, to have a female character that had that same oddness as those other characters. And, uh, and we auditioned uh, a, a lot of actresses for that role. Um, it, was, it was interesting because we were um, auditioning Asian actresses. And we had screen tested people and they were definitely the best screen test that I've ever been a part of. We had four actresses screen test. Each of them was completely amazing. And uh, Palm just happened to be the best in terms of being very emotional, which the character has to be that by her nature is her superpower, so to speak. She's an empath. Uh, and also just so alien at the same time.